Hello, I'm Forrest Tanaka, and this is part three of my astrophotography series. Now, it's been a long time since part two. Thing was, I filmed part three oh, many months ago, but I just wasn't able to get to the part about post-processing. So that footage was sitting on my hard drive for a long time doing no one any good. So I decided to do the Harry Potter Twilight thing and break the last part into two parts. So today's is part three, and then there will be a part four specifically on post-processing. So enjoy part three. Welcome to part three of three of my astrophotography series, where I'm going to tie up the loose ends. Now, in part one, I talked about choosing an OTA, or the actual telescope itself. Part two, I talked about choosing a mount. Part three, I'm going to talk about auto guiding, which is hardware and software that lets your mount track stars with deadly accuracy. I'll also talk about periodic error correction, which is a way for your mount to understand its own flaws and even correct them. Now you saw in part two that with a 60 second exposure, this telescope, my uh, 8 inch Newtonian, and this German EQ mount by Celestron didn't track stars real impressively over that minute. Now most of the time you could do better than that, but to do much better than that you'd really have to nail your polar alignment, and your mount has to be really unbelievably flawless. So you can use one of these, and it's called an auto guider. And there's a handful of these on the market. And what this does, it's, it's a little camera, and it looks at the stars around the thing that you're imaging, that you're photographing, and if it detects that the stars are beginning to drift a little bit, meaning that your mount isn't quite tracking right, then it can tell your mount to speed up or your mount's RA motor to speed up or slow down a little bit. That way your uh, stars and the object that you're photographing, of course, will stay locked exactly where they should be during your entire exposure. And it can optionally tell your deck motor to move up or down as well. So I chose this Orion Starshoot Auto Guider. Now it's basically a webcam, except it has no lens, so the sensor's sitting right there. So make sure you don't let your kids stick their fingers in there. Now like any webcam, it has a USB port to connect to your laptop, and it also has an RJ11 jack that connects to an RJ11 auto guider mount, or auto guider port on your mount, or at least mounts that have an auto guider port. Your auto guider goes into your guide scope. So that means your guide scope needs a standard one and a quarter inch eyepiece attachment, so that you can remove your eyepiece, and slip in your auto guider. Now I got this uh, auto guider guide scope as one package, uh, mostly because my old guide scope didn't have a one and a quarter inch eyepiece attachment. But realistically, this auto guider you can get it alone as long as you already have a guide scope with a one and a quarter inch eyepiece attachment. Now there is another way to attach an auto guider to your telescope without using a guide scope. And that's to use what's called an off-axis guider. Now, I've never used one. I don't have one to show you. I can show you a picture of one that's for sale. And you can look here. This is made by Orion. Costs $100, $150 US. And my understanding is this end goes into your focuser and your camera attaches to this end and your auto guider goes into the side. Uh, and the light from your main optics goes through a prism in the middle and reflects some of the light into your auto guider. Now this does have the advantage where if there's any flex in your system between your uh, guide scope and your main optics, this avoids that problem. But it does have some disadvantages too. The main one being your field of view looking through your main optics is pretty small and so you may have a hard time finding any guide stars bright enough for your auto guider to uh, guide off of. And another problem is the is focus because you have both your auto guider and your camera that both need to focus on your stars, and that can be a big challenge. And you may need to use extension tubes or something to get both of them in focus. So really, in general, your easiest choice is just to use a guide scope. After you polar out, polar align your mount and star aligned it, if you have a go-to mount, you need to connect your auto guider to your laptop over USB. Once you do that, your laptop can see the stars through your guide scope. Also, connect 
your auto guider to your mount with uh, that cable that looks kind of like a phone cable. Now once you do that, your laptop can tell your mount what to do through your auto guider. So that's the hardware side. Now let's take a look at the software side. Now nearly everyone I know who uses an auto guider uses a little software package called PHD, which stands for Push Here Dummy. And that's really what it's called. It's written by Craig Stark of Stark Labs. And uh, it, you can download it. It's available for both Mac and Windows, but I've only ever used the uh, Windows version because as you saw in part two, I use the Backyard EOS program written by Guillaume Rochon, if I pronounce that anywhere, anywhere near correctly, uh, from Binary River Software. And that one's only available for Windows. Now my Polar Align Star Align Telescope is tracking our demonstration object for tonight, which is the Ring Nebula in the constellation of Lyra. Now this is a pretty bright object, so it's a pretty easy one to do uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere in the summer and fall. Now, to show that it's properly pointing and tracking this object, I'm going to use Backyard EOS to take a 15 second ISO 6400 snapshot. And there you go. Now, this is where we were at the end of part two, an unguided shot of our object. But before I get into how to take a guided shot, let's take a moment to talk about observing site etiquette. Now, if you're at a dark site with other people and not in your own backyard, you need to observe some etiquette. Your laptop screen, even at its dimmest, is blinding when you're at a dark site. So you need to make sure everything you have that's illuminated is illuminated red because red light doesn't kill people's dark adjustment as badly as white light. So for my laptop, I use Mac software called Red Screen which makes the entire display red. And it stays red even when I switch to Windows, when I use uh, Parallels or something like that. Now, Backyard EOS also comes with a free app called Backyard Red, which is helpful. But uh, Mac users like me uh, really need to have something on the Mac side controlling it, like Red Screen, uh, if we uh, keep switching between Mac and Windows mode. Now, your cell phone should be at its dimmest, or just don't use it. And if you, <clears throat> if you use a star chart app, many of them, on a tablet or something, many of them come with a really handy red mode, which is really good. And if you use a flashlight, you can either tape some uh, red lighting gel to it, or if you can find one, get a red LED flashlight like one that happened to come with my telescope. And last, when you go to a dark site, plan on leaving at the same time as other people leave. That way everyone's headlights are on at the same time, not just yours. Now I've switched to PHD, and the first thing we need to do is connect PHD to our guide scope, or our auto guider. So you click this little sort of like a Minolta icon, it asks you what kind of auto guider it is, and it shows the right one by default here. Click OK. And now the status at the bottom says camera, scope, and no cal, meaning it's connected to the camera, the guide, the auto guider. It's connected to the telescope mount, but it's not calibrated. So this is all correct. First thing we need to do is take a dark shot. This is a shot that you take with the guide scope's cover on to uh, help eliminate some of the noise. So first, take dark. It asks you to put the guide scope cover on, then click OK, let it take the dark shot, then uncover the guide scope and click OK. So now we need to start getting a live feed from the auto guider. So click the circular arrow icon, And there's our live feed. Now you can choose how long the exposure is. By default, it's one second. If you're finding the stars are too dim, you can increase it to two, three, five, maybe as long as 10 seconds. Although it gets to be kind of painful at that length. Now you need to choose a star for it to guide on. Now it can't be too bright or it'll look like a circle 
that PHD has trouble tracking. It has to be a star with a nice pinpoint center that fades out around it. Now I usually just have it choose a star for me by going to Tools, Auto Select Star, and that's the star it's chosen. Now it drew a square around the selected guide star, but that just means it's selected. It doesn't mean it's tracking. So now click the icon that looks like a target with an arrow through it. And then once it draws those that crosshair, that means it's calibrating the mount. This is a process that takes several minutes, so you can sit back and look at the stars or go inside. Okay, now PHD is using your guide scope to actively track the guide star. And we know this because the status in the bottom right corner of the PHD window says camera, scope, and now it says cal instead of no cal. So it is actively guiding. Now what that means, of course, is that it's if the RE motor isn't pushing your telescope quickly enough to keep up with the stars, it'll tell it to speed up a little. And on the other hand, if it's the mount is moving too quickly, it'll tell it to slow down a little. So it really helps to nail your tracking. Now, the tricky part here is I have it right now configured to also track the deck motor. Now, in theory, you shouldn't need to do this because if you don't need deck tracking at all, as long as you properly polar calibrated or polar aligned your mount. But it's hard to do exactly right. It's easy for stars to drift a little bit, even if you did it right. So, what I usually do is I have deck tracking turned on, which is an option in VHD. But you do run into backlash problems. The RE motor is constantly pushing on the gears, so you don't run into backlash issues there. With the deck motor, which isn't actually supposed to be moving, it'll push it one way and then that's too much, so it tries to push it back the other way. And each time it takes a couple of minutes at least for the backlash or the play in the gears to get cleared out. So deck tracking is tricky, and I'll show you what I do uh, to handle it in just a bit. Now, go to the Tools menu and bring up Enable Graph. Now this brings up a really interesting and very useful graph. The middle line is where your tracking should be. And if you zoom in, you'll see a bright line represents RA tracking, and a dim line represents deck tracking. And you can see they're just sort of jiggling around this middle line, and so our tracking is pretty good. Now, usually your RA line will be pretty solid, but it'll be the dimmer deck line that'll show the problems. So what do you do about deck tracking backlash issues? And you'll know you're running into this because you'll see the deck line gradually moving up or down, and then careening across the middle line way too far, and then gradually moving up again, and then going back down again really suddenly. And it's just awful for tracking. So what I found is a way to not really solve the problem, but to kind of work around it. It's just to turn on north or south deck tracking, whichever way it happens to work better. That way it only pushes on one side of the deck motor. And it, that makes it act a little bit more like RA tracking. And I found it does a good job of uh, keeping deck in control while not causing all these big backlash problems. So it's worth giving a try. All right, so now it's following the guide star really well. So let's take a two minute snapshot, 120 seconds, and see what we get. And we can see this is much better than the one minute exposure that I took in part two. Let's zoom in here. Turn all this stuff off. And that is a pretty good ring nebula and some pretty good solid stars. And if we look at our PhD graph, we can see during those two minutes it tracked really well in both RA and DEC. So that's guided tracking. And if you want a sky full of deep space objects that you can successfully photograph without too much frustration, I'd say that an auto guider and PhD software is pretty much required. Now let's talk about periodic error correction. Now every mount has motors that push on gears. Now in most cases, even in consumer grade 
uh, tracking mounts. These gears are cut very precisely. But astrophotography has precision needs that go beyond what any manufacturer could possibly do with precision, where you need really sub arc second accuracy. Now, things like auto guiders help a lot with that problem. But some mounts give you an extra tool to help, and that tool is called periodic error correction. Now, the thing about flaws in the gearing of a mount is that it repeats. Every time, the gear turns around once, and the same flaw keeps coming around. Now, that means there's some predictability to these flaws, especially if they use integer multiple gear ratios, which many mounts actually do, like 3 to 1 ratios or 10 to 1 or something like that. Now, things that are predictable can be recorded, and those recordings can be played back. And that's exactly what periodic error correction does. Okay, now let's summarize. My telescope is polar aligned, the go-to controller is star aligned, and the auto guider is actively tracking stars right now. So now let's configure PEC. On this mount, I go to the utilities menu and choose PEC. And then I hit enter and I choose record. It says press enter to begin, and I hit enter. And now it's recording how PHD is moving the mount. Okay, the, guide, the auto guider is feeding a live image of the guide star to PHD, and PHD is sending correction signals to the mount to correct for any anomalies in the way it's moving. And PEC on the mount is recording those correction signals into its own memory. Now, after the gears in the mount have rotated around once, PEC recording will stop automatically, and then all you have to do is go back to the PEC menu and choose Playback. So now, when the gearing of your mount reaches a point where flaws in the gears would make the mount slow down, your mount knows that because of the recording that's in its memory that we just made. And so at that point, it'll speed the mount up to compensate for that flaw. So PEC and auto guiding work together to really keep your telescope locked into how the stars are moving as the Earth rotates. Now, some say that PEC and auto guiding fight each other and you should never use them together. But I'm actually getting this from the Celestron manual that for deep sky imaging, if you use PEC, you have to use it with auto guiding. Now, for most of parts one and two of this series, and up to this stage of part three, we've been talking about mechanical issues with astrophotography. And now, we're all done. Yes, we're done with part three. And like I said at the beginning, there will be a part four specifically about post-processing. Now, I want to take a moment to thank all my subscribers. You guys are just amazing, and I never imagined it would uh, become so big. So, in 2014, I plan on actually doing more on astrophotography, uh, just not part of this intro series. So, once again, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I will see you next time in part four.